I'm Isabella, the team manager for NGNG, and I'm super stoked to have an interview here with another one of our amazing athletes, Amy Sprawson. Amy has an epic race resume, including top performances at Western States, UTMB, and the Hurt 100, and that's just to name a few here. You should check out her ultra sign-up page. She has done so many ultras here. Um, Amy has also spent the last few years in Jordan, where she worked for the Mercy Corp Syria program and also set the FKT for the Jordan Trail. This course starts at the Syrian border and runs the length of the country for 401 miles with over 15 and a half miles of ascent. But today we are going to chat about Amy's new FKT attempt, which she's going to start later this week on the Appalachian Trail. So Amy, thank you for joining us today. Thanks. It's, it's fun to be here. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to jump into some questions here so our audience can kind of get to know you and uh, how amazing you are. So let's just short start with a, a short introduction here, maybe a little summary of how you got into ultra running in the first place. Okay, I'm actually sitting in my parents' basement right now, so I have some running memorabilia, memorabilia around me. But um, yeah, I've been a runner since I was in junior high. My dad and I actually started running at the same time. Um, and I ran through high school and college and then, you know, started running marathons after college, but I was a really, really nervous racer um, and just hate the pre-race anxiety. So the longer the, the race, the less nervous I get. And so I kind of got into ultras because I'm less likely to dry heave at the start line in a um, hundred miler than in a 5k. So every year I run a 5k and I have not run a 5k since my senior cross-country regional meet because it just it scares the crap out of me so <laughs> I totally understand that so how long would you say you've been running ultras for how many years yeah I ran my first ultra at the end of um, 2006 so yeah like I guess that's 16 years now so it's been wow a while. and yeah. you have just looking at your ultra sign up and I'm sure not all of your ultras are even on that platform but I think you have 77 on there if I'm not mistaken yeah. There's definitely some like global ones that are missing. And so, yeah, we're probably up around 90 to hundred somewhere. Wow. So yeah. And do you have like a special or a certain distance you like the most for when it comes to ultras? Um, I mean, I think historically I would say the hundred K, um, mm -hmm. it's long enough that it's, you know, you kind of have to figure it out, but it's short enough that you, it's not quite the same issues. Like you can finish in a day, which is kind of nice. You know, it's sunlight when you start and it's usually sunlight when you finish. So I really like the 100K, but as I've gotten older, I've tended to the more, the longer stuff. So right now my, probably my favorite race is Tour de Jean, which is a 330 kilometer race in the Alps that takes, you know, upwards of a hundred hours. And so that one, I definitely like to go back and, and I'd like to have a good race there one year. So. Wow. So um, not all of us finish 100Ks in the daylight, but I do get <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so what kind of, you know, you've, you've done all these ultras, you've done all these races, what kind of made you start wanting to set or break FKTs? And for those that aren't aware, FKTs are the fastest known times. Yeah, I've only done one FKT. Um, and that was when I was living in Jordan. And actually, I was signed up to do the Tour de Jean, the race in Italy that year, and it was canceled because of um, COVID. And so I wanted to find something local and all the, lo the local races, there are a lot of trail races in Jordan or ultras anyway, and um, they were kind of all canceled too. So the Jordan Trail, yeah, it's a 440 kilometer, or sorry, 660 kilometer, um, you know, straight path across Jordan. Uh, so it just kind of, it just made sense to try to do that because, uh, there had been no women that had done it before. So I wanted to be the first woman to first woman to send FKT on the Jordan trail. So just kind of put it. Love so. it. And what were kind of some of the challenges you had setting the FKT in Jordan? You know, well, first off was just kind of scouting the trail. A lot of it's pretty remote. And at the time I didn't know how to navigate very well. So um, the Jordan trail is not marked. Um, the first there's, it's divided into eight sections, and the first two sections have uh, have marks, but then after that, it's all just navigation. And it's not, I mean, it's called a trail, but it's a it's not really a trail, it's a GPX track. And so, you know, it was just hand and phone the whole time, just kind of like making sure you're still on the line. It's a lot of bushwhacking, 
Um, you go through wadis, which are basically canyons that you're just kind of like traversing your way down. So it was a lot of figuring out like how to navigate and how to find the route. Um, the actual FKT went really smoothly. I had an amazing team. I did it supported style. So when you're going after FKTs, you can either do it supported style or self-supported style. And that's kind of the big difference between the Jordan Trail and the Appalachian Trail coming up is the Jordan Trail, I did it supported. So I had a team of like four or five guys and a bunch of friends came out and they were following me the whole way. You know, I, I subsist, I lived on like McDonald's cheeseburgers, watermelon ice cream bars. And um, I had like 85 Mirindas, which are those, that orange, like it's the orange Pepsi version of Fanta. So like I had, I just had support the whole way. And on the Appalachian Trail, um, I'm doing it self-supported, which means I carry all of my own stuff and I'm not allowed to have any outside help. And so it's going to be really a big switch in, in styles in terms of how I, you know, how I go about it. I mean, the one nice thing about the Appalachian Trail, though, is it's actually marked and it's an actual trail, which is part of the reason I wanted to do it. Um, I really missed being on trails when I was in Jordan. Um, friend, my running buddies in Jordan would say we're going out trail running, but it's like, okay, like, is this a gravel road or is this like a paved road or like what kind of trail are we going out on today? And so I'm really excited to be this on a single track um, green trail for a long, long ways. So. And I remember we discussed the Jordan Trail before. For for those that are want to learn more about this, there's actually a blog that we wrote um, two years ago. It's on the NGNG website uh, right after she uh, finished the Jordan FKT. And you had some other challenges, too, where you had to actually stop at night for safety reasons, right? And sleep? Yeah, well, I mean, it's also, it's a, it's a bit of a longer. So it took eight and a half days. So I think with some of those that kind of anything over like four days, it's hard to just kind of push the nights. You really have to sleep to recover. Um, but yeah, with my crew, we kind of pre-planned where we would stop every day. And it was roughly 50 miles a day. And so, you know, I didn't try to go past like eight o'clock at night. Usually I'd usually stop and then, you know, get a full night's sleep and then get up and get going by about six. So yeah, that'll all be another difference with the self-supported AT. I can kind of stop and go when I want. So I'll probably try to move slower and just be out there for more hours a day. So um, what kind of attracted you to the AT trail then? You like how it's a trail, you like how it's marked, any other reasons why you wanted to break this FKT in particular? Yeah, I've definitely, I've been familiar with the Appalachian Trail since I started trail running. I, I started trail running when I lived in Washington, DC. And Washington DC is about an hour from Shenandoah National Park, which the trail runs through. So the trail runs, I can't remember what percentage of the trails in Virginia, but it's almost 30%. So the trail runs like the long ways through Virginia. So there's a lot of VAT in Virginia. So those were like the original trails that I started running on were, were the trails in Virginia, like along the Appalachian Trail. And, um, and so I, I was actually, because Jordan, Jordan's a beautiful country, but it's extremely brown. I'm um, kind of joke that we call it. 50 shades of beige because there's two months of green in the spring, but the rest of the month it's, it's, you know, it's sandy desert. Um, the parts that are green in the spring are the plants all turn brown and spiny. There's, I think the Jordan trail maybe has about 2% shade along it. So it's always exposed sun. Um, oh, wow. so I was actually in Syria in December um, and work's been a little, work been a little stressful. And I just, I really dismissed and also in Syria, I wasn't allowed to, to move about outside. And so I was, you know, kind of locked in the compound and just really missing like trails and green space. And so kind of at the same time in December, I decided to take a break from my job, which I just stopped my job on July 1st um, and just decided I really wanna go hike the Appalachian Trail. It just kind of came to me in a, I don't know, in a, like, yeah, I was laying in bed one night and just all of a sudden I'm like, I just decided that this is like what I was gonna do. So. It's a trail I'm familiar with. It's it's known as the Green Tunnel. So it's very green. You're always in the forest. I mean, you kind of come up on these grassy knobs, but generally speaking, it's the East Coast mountains. And so it's rugged, it's rocky, but you're also always surrounded by trees, which after being in Jordan for three years was just super appealing to be surrounded by greenery. So that was a lot of why I decided um, on the Appalachian Trail. It's also, it's a trail I've known. I've always wanted to do this, but because of work, et cetera, it's, you, you almost never have like two months where you can just take off and do this. So I decided, you know, I'm not getting any younger. So I just needed to make it happen. So I decided to take a, a break from work and, 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 and go for it. So. And you're going to start from the North and go to South or the other way around. 
I'm actually starting from the south and going north. And so most of the, they call that Novo, like northbound. And so most of the northbound hikers would have started in April or May, because um, okay. it takes most people, I think four to six months is, is around the average. Um, and so what they call the bubble, which is where like the, the big group of northbound hikers is, is they're probably about halfway right now. And so yeah. I'll start, if, if all goes to plan, I'll start running into northbound hikers when I get into like the last 30% of the trail. So I won't have a lot of company down south, except for maybe seeing some southbound hikers come through, but then in terms of through hikers, but then as I get north, I'll start to hit like the hikers and the trail magic and the, the trail angels and stuff like that, so. So what is the current FKT and what's your goal to break it? Yeah, there's several records on the Appalachian Trail. So the, okay. the record I'm really going for is the self-supported FKT for women. And right now the self-supported women's FKT is Heather Anderson at 54 days. Uh, the men's record is 45 days by Stringbean, uh, Joe McConaughey. And so I'm trying to kind of split the difference. I'd like to do it in around 49 to 50 days. Oh, that's so exciting. So do you have a certain amount of miles you want to do a day? You said in Jordan, you did about 50 a day. Yeah, my goal is going also going to be, because in Jordan, I, did, I mean, I carry you know, like my hydration pack with some water and snacks, but generally speaking, you know, I got to reach my hand out and someone to hand me a Miranda. And so I definitely had a lot of support along the way. Um, in this case, I'm carrying a tent, I'm carrying a sleeping bag, I'm carrying, um, okay. you know, my, all the things I need to charge, like my Garmin and my Coros and my phone and my headlamps, et cetera. So I'll have about um, eight pounds of base weight. And then when you add food on, food's about two and a half pounds a day and I'll have anywhere from two to four pounds of food. So my pack will be around 15 pounds at the heaviest. Um, so I'll be carrying a bit more stuff, which makes it a little harder. Parts of the, parts of the Appalachian Trail are super, super technical. So when you get into like, for example, New Hampshire, there's parts that are just like, uh, class three scrambling. And so it's, you know, ladders and really rocky down, like the parts in Virginia can be, tend to be a little bit smoother and just kind of rolling hills. And so I'll try to make some time up when I'm farther south, knowing that I'll lose time when I'm up north mm -hmm. towards the end. And that's kind of why I decided to go northbound is because I tend to, I tend to be slightly accident prone. Um, so I have a feeling there's a good chance I will fall off something at some point. And so if I'm, <laughs> fall off something and break something I want it to be at the end of my journey and not at the beginning of my journey so I want to go to the hospital so I'm like um yeah I'd like to get you know most of it in if something's gonna happen and so I mean that's I mean I could fall in Georgia too but like I'm hoping that I'll make my legs trail ready by the time I get to like New Hampshire and the whites and things like that so but you will be having one of those SOS trackers right yeah, I definitely will have a Garmin on me um, and I'll put that link with all of my friends and family so they can track me so what's cool about this trail and how you know you have all the through hikers, you have a lot of water stops, you have technology to show you where the water stops are, you're going to have see people on the route, mm -hmm. and um, you're able to have drops, right, yep. of your supplies. So maybe talk a little bit about your supply drops for a runner versus like a hiker. Yeah, and that was a lot of like, I, I worked through July 1st, and then I basically had a week to send out my boxes, and my boxes are my drops. And so I sent out supply drops to like 15 places. And so it's basically just boxes that have, um, depending on how far, far they are from the next drop, it has anywhere from two to four days of food. It's usually got a couple of pairs of Njinji in there so I can like keep having fresh socks. Um, I spaced out shoes every about four to 500 miles um, because again, the trail is really technical and rugged. And so I'm gonna wear the Hoka Speed Goat 5, but they will just get torn up after mm -hmm. three days miles um mm -hmm. so yeah i've spaced out and then i also have packed a, like a puffy and gloves and some warmer clothes when i hit vermont because when you get in new hampshire in the whites like there was actually a, a man was killed um a few weeks ago because of a, a freak snow i wasn't really a freak but like snowstorms can come in into the whites like I maybe mean, not the whites but mount washington is in new hampshire and that i think it's new hampshire i might i don't know the trail super well up north but you can get major weather up there kind of mm -hmm. anytime. You have to be prepared. So like down south, I won't need a puffy. I'll just have a rain jacket. But when you get up north, you just never know what's going to um, roll in, especially when you're getting towards the end of August and beginning of September. So mm. 
So yeah, for those who aren't aware, there is a ton of research and logistics involved before doing something like this. Like people don't necessarily realize all the stuff you do beforehand. Like you yeah. only did this in a week. I mean, I'm sure you've been planning longer been, than that, right? I'm ordering piecemeal, but then like the mm-hmm. actual pack boxes. I had a friend that wanted to come to town. She's a friend from, I was Peace Corps with her in Paraguay you know, 20 years ago. And she's like, can I come to Bend this weekend? And I'm like, yes, but you're going to be packing <laughs> boxes with me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she's definitely not a hiker runner. And so like when she learned that I was wearing one outfit for 22 miles, she was absolutely repulsed. I'm just like, this is like, like I can't believe you're not going to change your clothes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's details like that that some people don't really appreciate the fact that, yeah, I'll be wearing the same pair of shorts and t-shirt for basically 2,200 miles. So they have some really good wipes now these days that I've been taking camping and stuff like their uh, hustle clean is one brand and man, they're in the pretty nice now. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 uh, basically one wet wipe a day. Cause they do, cause they do weigh a little bit. And then I, after, after I packed, I discovered their dry wipes, which I, yeah, I unfortunately mm-hmm. did that beforehand, but yeah, things you learn as you're doing all the packing. So mm-hmm. exactly. So um, how has kind of your training been coming up to this the last few months? Yeah, you know, I I'd actually planned to start around June first, um, but then in March I was running in Jordan. And I had kind of a freak slight. I told you I was accident prone, so I mm-hmm. slipped on a really slick patch of mud going downhill and broke my sacrum, and so that kind of pushed my timeline back a couple of months. But um, that healed okay, and I uh, yeah, I've just been I've tried to tried to do a bit more hiking. So some running, but also just getting some hiking miles in. Um, I was out at Hard Rock last weekend. And definitely got some time out, like, you know, with my pack, you know, you know, going up some 13, 14,000 footers. So, um, yeah, I feel like my climbing legs are good and, um, I don't plan to run much of it. I really do plan to hike most of it. And so, um, it's just getting that time on feet and getting used to, um, you know, hiking with my pack. So. And being alone for being 50 alone. days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talking to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Do you listen to anything? On the uh, long trips? Yes and no. Like I'll probably have a couple of books downloaded in my library just to have them, but I'm also mm-hmm. really working on batteries and keeping everything charged. So yep. it'll depend a little bit on if it's a four-day stretch or a two-day stretch between um, boxes and what I think I can listen to. But um, but yeah, I'll probably plug in some podcasts and things when I'm just to, to pass some of the time. So. <laughs> Yeah, I bet hard work training was good. And there's all t- sorts of different types of weather there too. So yeah, like the rainstorms there are a little more severe than, you know, because you're above tree line, whereas usually mm-hmm. you at least be, you know, if it's lightning, at least you're under the forest. So yeah, good training. Um, okay, so we kind of went over like your gear training. Um, you're bringing lots of socks and shoes, keep your feet happy, because that's kind of a big thing, right? Like not getting blisters or um, do you carry like little blister packs with you and feet care packs and first aid and all that? Yeah, I've got a fairly extensive first aid kit. Like I definitely have got some like squirrels, nut butter for, um, to keep things kind of looped up. Um, and I've got a bunch of different types of blister patches. Um, I am really worried about blisters and also, you know, everyone tells you, you should order bigger shoes for later on in the trail. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to predict like when and how much your feet are going to swell. So you know, I have a friend that works at a running store in North Carolina. So worst case scenario, I'm like, make sure you have plenty of, you know, 10 point, 10 and a half on, on, in stock. So if I call in a panic, you can, you can mail them ahead for me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to predict kind of what the problems are going to be, but your feet are going to be really wet most of the time. So just, mm-hmm. I'll have a couple of pairs of socks where I'll try to keep one, you know, one clean and dry and like wash them every day. So the next day I have a, a clean pair to put on. So yeah, just trying to keep, feet dry and happy or not dry per se, but yeah, as happy Happy. as. (laughs) And uh, so when you hydrate for something like this, you filter your water, you don't have to carry much with you. Are there certain types of uh, foods you use that weigh less and pack small for a trip like this? And do you like how many calories an hour do you do and that sort of thing? Yeah, I basically calculated, and this is completely just out of the blue, but I was shooting for 5,000 calories a day. Um, mm-hmm. there will be a lot of places where you can kind of add on calories, like you'll walk through towns and stuff. So, you know, you can get burgers and milkshakes and whatnot, but my base packing was 5,000 calories a day. And that's mainly from like, my breakfast is some, uh, flavor of overnight oats. So I've got like 
you know, they make powdered peanut butter. So, you know, I've got my peanut butter oats and my dehydrated, mm -hmm. you know, or freeze dried strawberry blueberry oats. So I made a bunch of different flavors. And so that's kind of breakfast. And then dinner is a combination of instant mashed potatoes and beef sticks and or uh, dehydrated quinoa and uh, pinto beans with taco seasoning and Fritos. And so mm -hmm. high calorie and low weight, um, little packets of olive oil to add some fat to that. Um, and then during mm -hmm. the day, a lot of bars, a lot of nut butters. So I packed a few different, a few different brands of nut butter and basically like around 800 calories of nut butter a day. And then, yeah, I mean, nuts and oil, nuts and fats have kind of the highest bang for your buck in terms of mm -hmm. uh, calories. And so I tried to pack a lot of kind of keeping a balance of some carbs some protein, some fats, but then trying to get the things that weigh the less. So for me, 5,000 calories weighs about two and a half pounds a day. So four days of food is about 10 pounds, which um, it's quite a bit. So it's, it's yeah. kind of encouraging stuff as you go just to lighten your load as well. So, so you carry a jet boil with you to have hot water I mean, for those? I'm not carrying a jet boil. I'm doing everything what they call cold soak. And so like the, okay. you know, and beans that they've been, they've been hydrated and then dehydrated. And so like the quinoa was cooked and then dehydrated. So when you add water to it, it actually soak, it um, soaks up the water pretty well and turns back into fairly edible quinoa and beans. And so- I never knew of that. That's amazing. Yeah. That just lightens your load right there by not having to carry the yeah. jet boil with you. Yeah. And it also saves a lot of time not having to stop and cook. So about an hour before I want to eat dinner, I'll add water to the it's a, you know, Talenti gelato jar that I put the beans in mm -hmm. and then I add the water and about an hour later, it's, or half an hour later, it's, or it's ready to eat. So. Yeah. Nice. Is there certain uh, brands of bars you like that are high calorie? Um, yeah, I have a lot of Bobo bars with me and a lot mm -hmm. of pro those both like a Bobo bar has about 340 calories. Mm -hmm. It's fairly moist, but not too heavy pro bars. Yeah. I have uh, 400 calories, pretty small. Um, I allowed myself basically 400 calories of gummy bears or some form of candy a day because that tends to be pretty heavy, but it's also kind of that joy of, you know, nibbling. It gives on. you a boost mentally, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I hear that a lot. Yeah. So For me, it's Pop-Tarts. Yeah. Yeah. I did not pack any Pop-Tarts, but I, I, I'm sure they're readily available along the trail. So. And do you know where all the McDonald's are in the towns when you? Yeah, I'm told <laughs> there's not a lot of McDonald's, which really kind of me out, but I'm hoping that <laughs> A few. <laughs> Any orange Fantas? Maybe <laughs> Hardee's. It can be you know whatever random burger joint. But yeah, the burgers. That I mean, him, McDonald's at least they never break down. So if you pass McDonald's, you can pick up like four and eat them for a few days. <laughs> but they're high calories, right? High, and they, they yeah. make you smile. So yeah. you're starting a little later this week. Um, are you allowing people to kind of follow you and track you, or are you kind of keeping that private for your, your crew with the GPS tracker? Yeah, I'll, I probably won't share the GPS or the GPX tracker publicly, but I will mm -hmm. uh, post on Instagram just like a few days delayed. So perfect. Yeah. So we can kind of follow you along the way. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Um, how about any tips or advice for people who maybe want to set an FKT or who are looking to do the Appalachian Trail? How to get yeah. started on that? Yeah, I mean, for FKTs, there's a really good resource right now, um, especially for women, uh, women who FKT. They're really trying to promote, because um, the they put out the stats of last year, and last year in the, in the Pacific Northwest specifically, there were very few women's FKTs compared to kind of FKTs by men. And so they really are women to go out and they have a list of like all the trails out there, at least in the Pacific Northwest that have men's that don't have women's FKT. And they didn't, so far this year, I don't know what the stats are, but there's more women's FKT set than men's this year. And so that's a really good resource to check out on Instagram. Um, I think it's just women who FKT. Um, I love it. Yeah. So they're really trying to push, you know, women going after. So it's just finding on, on the website as well, the FKT website, you know, there's a everything's out there. And so just looking up trails in your local area and maybe finding one where there's no women's time and, and, and going for it or Ooh, new challenge. Trail. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. But I definitely 2023. Check out, hmm. yeah, FKT is, is a great resource. Um, for the Appalachian trail. I mean, I just basically spent the last few months 
looking up YouTube videos, looking at blogs. Um, there's a couple of books that get published every year about like where you where you send your mail drops, et cetera. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, but yeah, there's some popular like YouTubers that are Appalachian trail hikers that I just kind of dove into and then really started just watching a lot of videos on um, gear and whatnot. Cause the gear these days is really amazing. Like my tent, you know, weighs 13 ounces. My sleeping bag weighs 13 ounces. Like it's, it's all just feels like nothing. So gear has come a long way. And so you really can lighten it up and try to move faster. Oh, I totally agree. I finally got like a backpacking sleeping bag two years ago. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And yeah. they're so warm. They are so warm. <laughs> yeah, mine's 30 bag and it's, you know, 13 ounces. This is incredible. So yeah, I love the, the technology these days. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks, Amy, for chatting with us today. Uh, we're super pumped for you to take this on and we'll be following along on your Instagram page. Um, I have no doubt you're going to set this FKT. Super I excited. Hope. And um, I know your feet are going to be very happy the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who want to follow, what's your Instagram handle? Yeah, it's just my name, Amy Sproston. So it's, um, yeah. That's it. All right, cool. And we'll have that in the link here. So thank you so much, Amy.